When we hold off on grieving, when we hold off on feeling the intensity of our emotions, when we tell ourselves that we're not important enough or worthy enough to take up this space because I mean, look at all of these other people, these movements that are happening, the things that are going on in the world. There are so many people that have much bigger and better reasons to grieve right now than I do. But that doesn't make my grief inconsequential, nor does it make yours. Welcome to Pleasure Central Radio, the place to rethink the assumptions we don't even realize we are making that keep us from getting what we truly want out of work, life, and love. Here is your sneak peek into an authentic, pleasure-focused conversation. Hey you, thanks for tuning in. Just a quick heads up, this episode is rated PG-13, so expect to hear some mild language or adult concepts. Yesterday I had a pretty blissful day. I thought, you know, I think I've figured out this pandemic stuff. I've got my antibodies, I'm moving around in the world, getting to see a few more people, connecting having new relationships and lovers that I can really hunker down with and find a lot of meaning together with. I've got meaning in my work. I'm still able to see people that I care about. I figured out how to move my body again. And then this morning, I found out about the new strain in Brazil, which may make my antibodies useless again which may mean that it would be smart to isolate again, which doesn't mean that that's what I'm going to do. But it brought about a lot more grief than I was expecting today. Especially, you know, yesterday and this morning, I woke up feeling like I figured this out. I'm okay, I'm good now. And yet, Here I am again, having more feelings. More feelings which don't feel very pleasurable on the surface. Feelings which are inconvenient. Feelings which don't look bright and shiny from the outside or from the inside. After I published episode 78, The Light in the Dark, I received a lot of great feedback from it. Thank you, by the way. Great feedback, especially curious about how I was able to do some of the things that I did. One of the questions was, what happened when I was 17? What was the sacred space that my peers created for me in order to allow me to grieve? And it's actually a very simple answer. I was a part of a small group in high school called Peer Counselors. The school counselor had gathered together a I don't know, six or a dozen of the high school students and decided to train us on how to be counselors to our peers, how to help our peers through whatever they were going through. It was a lovely thing. I'm so glad that they did that. One of the ways that she decided to train us was giving each one of us a day to teach one particular concept that would be helpful for counseling our peers. And she had been around when my mom had died, and so she asked if I would be willing to do the the day on grief. And so I agreed, knowing it would probably be kind of hard, but I was willing. This was an important thing, so I was willing to do it. And the day that we were supposed to come together was during one of our regular classes very small group of peer counselors gathered in the counselor's office and and they just asked me about grief, what it feels like, how they could be helpful. Honestly, I don't remember everything that we talked about. I mostly remember crying for the entire hour. I remember sharing what it was like to be told at my mom's funeral by somebody, I don't even remember who, I was distracting one of my siblings. 
chasing her around a pillar. We were laughing and giggling. And someone came up and told us, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be sad. And that sucked. To have found a little bit of pleasure in a day when there seemed like there wasn't any. And to be told that that was inappropriate. And that was how I found out our culture really doesn't have a space for grief. We don't grieve very well in the U.S. But I think that hour with my peers crying, bawling, really, was so healing because I got to be seen in my grief. I got to be seen and witnessed. These weren't people that were seeing me crying and trying to get away from it. They were uncomfortable, but they weren't trying to shut me down or change me or make me be happy. They were just letting me be, letting me be with my grief, be with my pain. That's one of the secrets about emotion, is that if we allow ourselves to be with it just for a little while, it starts to change and it transforms into something else. Looking back on this year, I think I've realized why I had such a hard time. I really spent the second half of the year needing to grieve, but not feeling like I could. Not feeling seen in my grief. After all, <laughs> I'm a rich white girl who was never in danger of losing her home. Yes, I had some financial ups and downs, and yes, I did get sick. But the most devastating thing that happened for me this year it was about the shifting in my friend group, my social group. I was looking back on it recently, and I realized that nobody that I was spending time with regularly pre-pandemic is still in my life, except for the people who pay me or who I pay. I have two coaches that I pay that I still see regularly. And I have a small handful of clients who I've known since before the pandemic and still get to see each other regularly. All of my friends, all of my lovers, all of my partners, everybody else, the people that I would see incidentally at the gym, at tango dances, all of those social acquaintances, gone. All of my friends, partners, and lovers have fucked off to their own families. And I understand that. This has been a year of uncertainty and fear, and of course you want to huddle up with your people, with your tribe. If you're doing the bubble thing, of course, you're going to tighten your bubble down to the people you care about most. And not being in anybody else's bubble that they cared about most was devastating. Of course, they wanted to go and be with their families. I understand that. This morning, I was able to be on a Zoom call with a small group of people and four guests, very unique guests. It was four men on death row, all artists, and they've all been on death row for a very long time. And we were able to ask them questions about their art, how they keep creating, why they keep creating, what it means to them, what they hope to say with their art. These are artists who, in order to make music, have to use their 15-minute phone calls to dial into a Zoom meeting with their producer, rap over the phone, and then have the producer put together the music and share it out. Artists who have number two pencils without erasers and crappy paper, and that is what they get to draw with. And yet, they can make some incredible, beautiful drawings that look like photographs. These are artists who write books one chapter at a time, and because they don't have access to computers, they rewrite the entire chapter every time they make edits. I asked one of them, 
It sounds like there are a lot of hoops to jump through to get your art out in the world. Why do you bother? He told me he feels like he has a duty, that in prison there are so many personal liberties being violated every day on a daily basis. And he's asked the other prisoners why they don't fight back, why don't they stand up for themselves. And they said they just don't know how. So he writes and creates art in order to take a stand, and in order to show them that they can too, to encourage them to care enough about themselves to do something, to be creative, to use their minds. He said, because he can, he must. He has a duty. I realize that I have felt that way too, about my podcast and about the documentary that is being created. Someone asks me at the beginning of the documentary process why I was willing to risk so much putting my name and my face on camera. It's a big risk, but what I decided is that it's a worthwhile risk. I want to leave behind something for the next seven generations that shows them they don't have to be ashamed of themselves or their sexuality. They don't have to take on the limiting patterns that their parents showed them or that their culture has decided for them is what's appropriate. They can choose something better for themselves. They can choose something clearly. Earlier this year when I was in the height of my own distress, I noticed some interesting things. I noticed that I couldn't always feel my feet. I felt like I didn't trust where my feet were, where I was stepping. I thought that was just some post-traumatic stress from the foot injury that I had sustained earlier in the year. But now, I see it differently. Because of the feedback and the questions that I got on that episode about the light and the dark, I wanted to do some research about grief and the best way of handling grief partially for my own benefit, but also because I feel a certain amount of responsibility to make sure that what I put out into the world on this podcast is accurate and helpful and makes a difference in your life. So I ended up reading a book called Restoring the Warrior's Soul. It's a book by Edward Tick, a psychotherapist and somebody who's been dealing with veterans coming back from war for 20 or 30 years, possibly longer. He has a very shamanic perspective on PTSD, post-traumatic stress, and I found it very helpful to read that book and to learn about it. He does specifically talk about veterans in regards to post-traumatic stress. His work is not limited to people that have served in war. His work is helpful for anyone that has had post-traumatic stress. I finally read this book. It had been recommended to me by an ex-partner years ago, and I found it to be really helpful. And in that book, he talks about some of the native tribes and how when the tribe was threatened, the warriors would circle up around the rest of the tribe, and the most vulnerable population would be in the center the young children, the young mothers, then the adults, then the older warriors, and finally the young warriors on the outside to protect. But once the threat was over, the circle would be turned inside out. The tribe would surround the warriors. They would hold them, care for them, listen to them, paint their war wounds, letting them know that their pain and their injuries, mental, physical, emotional, had a purpose, and were appreciated. This is something that we don't do here in this country for our veterans. But we could. We should. I remember seeing a lot of memes at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, talking about how the greatest generation went off to war to protect us, and all we have to do is sit at home on our couches and watch Netflix. It is funny. But I think it also neglects 
to honor the sacrifices that we all have made for each other this year. If you have a family and you get to be with them on a regular basis, I'm really happy for you. And you may be unaware of what some of the rest of us have been going through to keep you safe and your parents safe. You see, one of the reasons why when I was 17, getting to grieve in front of my peers made such a difference was I actually felt seen. It was not really something I wanted to be seen for. I didn't want to be seen grieving. I would have crawled under the carpet if I could have. (sighs) But we can't heal what we don't acknowledge. One of the reasons I had such a tough time in the second half of this year was that it was so hard for me to acknowledge that there was anything for me to grieve. I had this unconscious attitude of, who wants to hear of a rich white girl complaining about her lack of touch and the fact that her friends have all left? I still have my work. I still have a fulfilling way to speak out to the world. I still have my health, even in spite of everything. Who am I to complain? All I had to do was sit on my couch and watch Netflix, (laughs) sit in my podcast studio and record, go on outdoors walks with people and try and make some new friends. (sighs) Poor pity, Rebecca, right? But the truth is, as much as I have been able to stay positive and keep moving forward and keep finding meaning in what I'm doing, the truth is, I have made huge sacrifices this year. And I'll bet you have too. If you're feeling unseen, or you're feeling like you can't connect to your body anymore, maybe you're just feeling numb. Pleasure doesn't feel like pleasure. You had to be numb to all the pain. You're not the only one. And guess what? If you let yourself be seen, let yourself be cared for, you can be healed too. It's a beautiful, sacred thing when someone is willing to see you without trying to fix you. I don't care who you are or where you've been this year. You have something to grieve. I know this is kind of a strange topic for Pleasure Central Radio, isn't it? But here's the thing. When we hold off on grieving, when we hold off on feeling the intensity of our emotions, when we tell ourselves that we're not important enough or worthy enough to take up this space because look at all of these other people, these movements that are happening, the things that are going on in the world. There are so many people that have much bigger and better reasons to grieve right now than I do. But that doesn't make my grief inconsequential, nor does it make yours. I had forgotten to feel in my body. Actually, I had forgotten how. (laughs) Slowly, day by day, becoming more and more numb to what's going on, to the fear and the pain around me. Other people's pain, other people's fear, all very real. I couldn't turn a blind eye to it. And I'll bet you can either. Nobody really knows how to treat you when you're grieving something big. There was another pivotal experience for me. I remember coming back to school after my mom died and the other kids, I wouldn't say they avoided me, but they didn't interact with me the way that they used to, with one exception. There was a kid in my class named Cody Moat. I will forever think of him as my guardian angel. We had a conversation one day, walking home from school, I think, somewhere out in the woods on the path home, and he just asked me, what's it like? How do you feel? What's going on? Do you need anything? Honestly, I don't even remember what he asked. I just remember being seen, being seen for where I was. They didn't project a way that I was supposed to be. They didn't try and cheer me up. He didn't make me laugh, but he was just there. 
that proved to me all it takes is one other human heart to hold you to start the healing process. It was powerful. It happened again for me this year. A couple of months ago, a woman named Fiona in one of my mastermind groups. She spent an hour with me over Zoom, and oh my, did it help just to be seen as a human, as a human with needs. An independent, confident, sure of myself human regardless, but still a human with needs. Fiona also helped me see that there are healthy ways to deal with grief. There's always a gift in the grief somewhere. And when we can find that gift and plant it, that seed grows into something incredible, beautiful, something that we never had access to before. It just wasn't in us before. We didn't have the capacity for that, but after the grief and after the healing, we'll have a whole new set of capacities, things that we didn't know that we could do, we didn't know were possible ways that we could open our heart that we had no idea were available for us. How is grief connected to pleasure? (sighs) Well, one of the things that I realized this year is that without processing my grief and my emotions, I started to slowly cut myself off from my body, stopped being able to feel, really almost stopped being able to have orgasms. It was bizarre. (laughs) I know that's happening for a lot of you out there too. I've heard from many people, sex drives have plummeted. Some of that is stress. Some of that might be just not being connected to your body anymore. One of the mastermind groups that I'm a part of, the coach gave us an exercise to twice a day write down what we were feeling in our body. It was really hard. I started to notice that the sensations of my body, I just, I could put a name to a feeling, but not so much a sensation. Sensation like there's heaviness in my chest, or there's a lightness in my toes, or there's a cramped feeling in my ankle. There's a tightness on the inside of my thighs that feels like I'm just bracing, constantly bracing for something, for the next bad, crazy, insane thing to happen. But as I started to pay attention to my body, I started to make the connections with what I was holding and what I could let go, what needed to shift and what mindsets I was able to change. And it reminded me of another thing. One of the big blessings for me in the last couple of months has been a new lover who is very curious about some BDSM stuff and some sensation play. And we've had a couple of sessions where we've played together and gotten to explore that. And it has reminded me how important BDSM can be in trauma release. This isn't something I'm an expert enough on to talk about it in any depth But I've known this for a long time. I've known this through my work. I've known this through personal life years before. For me, sensation play, which is things like ice cubes and very small electric shocks or being wrapped up in saran wrap to desensitize my skin or tiny little pinwheel pokes, blindfolds and feathers, any of those things, they have... They have a beautiful side effect of drawing me back into my body. So that may be for another episode. I'll talk more about that. But for now, I want you to remember something. It only takes one other human heart to hold you to start the healing process. Your pain has value, and it's worth being seen. And when you're willing to move through grief, through pain you will be able to find pleasure again. I promise you. It's there. It was there for me, and it'll be there for you too. Now go forth and be good to yourself. Hey, 
Hey, Pleasure Seeker. Well, that's it for today's conversation. Here at Pleasure Central Radio, we love using conscious communication, science geekery, and copious amounts of true pleasure to improve our partnerships, our money, and our love lives. And we hope you do too. If you loved what you heard here, we'd love a review. You can listen to other episodes of the podcast and read thought-provoking essays or poems written by me, Radiant Rebecca, by checking out the blog on PleasureCentralPodcast.com. Sign up to hear about new episodes immediately at PleasureCentralPodcast.com. Your thought to ponder today is... It's a beautiful sacred thing when someone is willing to see you without trying to fix you.